get started because we have a lot like left of the day still. Uh, I'm going to go up and get it. So I'm just going to welcome our moderator, um, who's going to introduce the rest of the panelists. Our moderator is Alyssa Katz. She's author, an author and member of the New York Daily News editorial board, and she has extensive experience covering community development, affordable housing, and policies at work in New York City's neighborhoods. So thank you very much, Alyssa. And I'll, you can take it away. Um, Thank you, Eva, and thank you, uh, Liz, the Furman Center, um, and the Federal Reserve. Um, so here we are, final panel, with the folks who hold the policy levers um, and who come from distinct disciplinary perspectives, different agencies, uh, and different disciplines. Um, and I want to take a moment to just appreciate, having heard what we've heard all day, how much work these panelists Others they have worked with and, and, and succeeded. Um, and, and folks in New York City more broadly have really done already um, to mitigate displacement. And clearly we are dealing with a really uh, enormous challenge. But I think you know, getting the national perspective, we see that, that New York also is, uh, has, has done a lot of very, very good work already that we need to, to build on. Um, and, and some of those accomplishments include inclusionary housing, um, anti-displacement efforts, anti-harassment um, efforts that we'll hear more about, um, neighborhood planning, and health equity. Um, so I also, you know, I want to hand things over to the panelists in a moment, but just also do want to note that, you know, this is, I think this is an excellent time to be having this conversation because um, as far as New York City has come and as strong as um, the de Blasio administration's plans to mitigate displacement and build affordable housing and preserve affordable housing are, that um, as they have evolved and um, begun to be put in play, they also are confronting certain challenges. And I think that you know, one thing I would like to come out of this panel and this day with is some fresh ideas on how to step back a bit from the work and think about um, how, to, how to tackle those challenges. Um, so with that, I'll introduce um, Vicki Bean, Commissioner of the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, uh, Purnima Kapoor, Executive Director of the Department of City Planning, uh, Council Member Brad Lander of Brooklyn, and uh, New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene Commissioner Dr. Mary Bassett. Um, so actually picking up where um, Michelle De La Ouse left off on the last panel, um, I do want to start with definitions, and definitions again of um, displacement and definitions of equitable development. Um, but also want to frame that a bit in, in, um, in terms of, um, I think, a fundamental um, question that I, I, these panelists and other folks doing um, the work of addressing displacement are really wrestling with. And that is, you know, is this challenge fundamentally about preventing displacement of low-income residents from their neighborhoods and from New York City itself? I mean, clearly um, something that, uh, that urgently needs addressing. Um, and, you know, in, to what extent are there other um, considerations or um, strategies in play? And how does, you know, how is the answer to look at how the big, pic at the big picture in individual neighborhoods address the kinds of policies and responses um, that, that you guys are implementing? So with that, I'm going to hand it over um, to the panel and just ask, how do you define displacement? How do you define equitable development? And again, how does the answer to that question inform sort of your broad strategic thinking about policy responses? Um, so let me start with displacement. I think that the goal of the city should be that all of our neighborhoods are diverse in all uh, forms, uh, income diversity, racial and ethnic diversity, and otherwise. And so to me, displacement is things that get in the way of that, things that push people out of homes um, that they live in now and that will result in less diverse communities and things that keep people from moving into um, places that they would like to live. In terms of equitable development, I think that we are a growing city. We're a city that's growing because we are doing very well and that with growth comes a variety of both burdens and benefits. And equitable development to me means that those benefits and burdens are shared across neighborhoods, across income groups, across racial and ethnic groups, and that 
no one group captures all the benefits and no one group bears all the burdens. So I think um, adding on to what Vicky was saying here, I think, you know, we, historically we've been a city that has been changing. We've never been a static city. Our neighborhoods have continued to evolve from one ethnic group to another, from different income groups. I think it is when that mobility is not voluntary and it's forced and it's people who really are you know, not, not really able to afford anything better than where they are. I mean, we want people to continue to climb up the, you know, the, la the social ladder, the economic ladder, the mobility is what has kept New York City dynamic. You know, that is not something that's going to change. I think the pace of that has changed a lot in the last few years, as I think one of the panelists at um, um, the last panel was indicating. And I think in order for us to grow equitably, one, we have to grow. And we have to grow not just in population, but we also have to continue to produce housing for people. So the housing production is very, very important. But we have to grow in a way where the neighborhoods become places where there is room for all income groups. There is room for every um, racial, ethnic, and and uh, and uh, you know immigrant group. I mean, we are a city of immigrants. We, as immigrants come into the city, we will change. What is happening in the city in the last little while is that the new people who are coming in are really generally young, college-educated people. They are outnumbering some of the other more traditional income groups. And I think that's why uh, other immigrant groups. And I think that has manifested itself in different ways across the city, where what we have found is if you look at it demographically, it's change or, or displacement or housing rent increases is not just happening where people's incomes are going on up. Broadly, that is where it's happening. but. Rents are going up in areas where the incomes are not going up. So it's not like new wealthy people are moving into these neighborhoods that are displacing people that are there. It's really a shortage of housing that is causing that kind of a, a displacement. So, so I'm going to uh, build on this consensus, but I'm going to try to trouble it a little bit. Um, so on displacement, uh, uh, you know, I, I think I shared, I thought, you know, the, the prior panel did a very good job focusing. Obviously, we don't want people being involuntarily displaced from their homes and neighborhoods. And we have built a lot of new uh, resources to deal with that. Um, you know, the increase in resources for uh, attorneys, for tenants is quite extraordinary. And if you haven't read the annual report of the Office of Civil Justice, you know, that's the thing that Matthew Desmond, who wrote Evicted, has been pushing the longest. And it is making a profound difference in dramatically decreasing the likelihood that people will be evicted against their wills from their neighborhoods. We're from about 1% of tenants being represented to about a quarter. So that's a long way to go to 100%, but it is an extraordinary uh, step. There's a lot more we can do. I'm glad to talk a little more about the Certificate of No Harassment effort. That's one of the tools that I think Dina referred to that would make it the consequences of uh, harassing and displacing people from their homes more significant. And I think there are more things we can do to focus on the preservation of, of the existing affordable stock in neighborhoods. Um, but on equitable, equitable development, I want to push us a little bit more. Um, we might have a policy consensus in this room that we want mixed income inclusive communities, but I don't think we should treat that as sort of like a bland cliche. Um, if we did, that is a very different goal than I think we've ever had as a policy in this city or in this country. It is profoundly opposed to what the market wants in neighborhoods. It, it doesn't make sense from a certain point of view. I mean, are we really saying, and I share this point of view, I mean, I want it, but I don't want us to short sell it. If we're saying we like neighborhoods where, you know, the, the landlord on this address can get $3,000 for the rent and the landlord at this address has to take $800 uh, for the rent. And, you know, there's a time when that might have been called kind of crazy social engineering. If we believe it, and I think we should, then equitable development, and even though I think she's one of the, the smartest people in housing, I'm gonna argue with Dina on this, it's gotta be a lot more than just preventing 
displacement, we don't have a policy framework for anything like that. I mean, uh, our, if we wanted to say a policy goal was mixed income, inclusive neighborhoods where opportunity was shared and spread across a range of income and other kinds of groups, um, wow, we would need a very different fair housing set of policies than we have, which come from a sort of 1960s perspective, I think, and we would be thinking about some different things. We'd be asking, as we map mandatory inclusionary housing, are we making sure we're doing it in, in high-income neighborhoods? That's less about displacement. That's about creating opportunities for low-income people to live in high-opportunity neighborhoods. Are we looking at school integration? Because obviously a, a big challenge in the reproduction of the lack of opportunity is in segregated schools, which can manage to persist quite uh, successfully, even as you have gentrification or other things that uh, create mixed income communities. So is that part of our strategy? And we see some signs in the administration maybe of starting to warm to that conversation, but it's not something we've thought of as part of our public policy for equitable development and inclusive neighborhoods. And I think it would be a, a very exciting project to try to imagine what that policy framework would look like um, how much were we willing to do? How much were we willing to spend for it? Um, what does it mean uh, to think about diverse and inclusive and, and mixed income communities? And it's, it's definitely the moment uh, to try. Afternoon, everyone. I'm really pleased to be part of this conversation, although, of course, I bring quite a different lens uh, to it. Uh, uh, not so much the lens of what I consider sort of the inputs for a healthy life. Um, uh, but one of the outcomes of, uh, of housing. Uh, public health and, and uh, urban planning share roots. Uh, there was a time when public health talked mostly about uh, water, sanitation, buildings, uh, the physical structure of uh, cities, but we moved on to talking about microbes, which frankly is what takes up an incredible <laughs> amount of my time. But and we're, what, glad, <laughs> we're glad about it. <laughs> what I wanted to bring to this conversation um, is the, the way that we in the health department talk about what it means to be a healthy community. And of course, we use a very expansive uh, definition of health, which means uh, not just the absence of disease, but the a state of complete physical and mental well-being. And that applies not only to individuals, but to neighborhoods. And when we describe New York City, we point out that there is no majority group in our city. The largest minority group in our city is what we call whites. Uh, that we are a deeply segregated city. Uh, by some measures that are used by the census, we are in the top five most segregated cities in, in the country. And these uh, patterns of, uh, of race and income, because in our city, race and income track very closely, are, uh, are mirrored by patterns of health. Um, now, uh, public health has been very late coming to the idea of displacement as, uh, um, as, as a, a factor that affects health, but there is emerging evidence that uh, gentrification, uh, displacement of neighborhoods measured by the trajectory of neighborhood composition over time has an impact on premature uh, uh, births, on low birth weight, on hypertension, a leading, a leading preventable cause of death. So it has direct impact on people's health. So when we think about the costs that we pay when we disrupt communities, I'm hoping that I can convince this audience that we should add health to that. Uh, and it may be an unmeasured asset as well as an unmeasured cost that we pay. Okay, so I'd now like to get you. your reactions to certainly the last panel and for those of you who were here also for the national practitioners if there's anything uh, you'd like to uh, react to uh, there as well. It'll be interesting to hear. And just to summarize a few things that I heard that I would like to uh, hear about uh, uh, from you if you have something to say. Um, Michelle Neugebauer talked about a flip tax on real estate uh, investment. 
uh, on anti-harassment measures, I think above and beyond perhaps what the city is, is engaging in now. Um, legalizing accessory units, which I know is something that has been talked about, um, but I don't know the status of, of efforts there. Would be, I would like to hear about that. Um, community land trusts um, from Karim Hudson. We heard about planning for a downturn, planning for a different scenario. To what extent is that going on or worth talking about? Um, and as we mentioned, Dina had talked about um, not just the um, certificate of no harassment, but also the idea of an early warning system, sort of really improving our data analysis to tell us where we have um, hot spots and trouble spots that can respond to enforcement of current laws, right, of current code enforcement, anti-harassment uh, laws and regulations. So I'll turn that over to the panelists, wherever you would like to jump in. Um, okay, so so first of all, just to because it's late in the day and we need a little controversy, I'm gonna just jump right into that. Um, so I, I disagree with you, uh, Council Member Lander. Um, I think that the housing plan lays out a very clear vision of an economically and racially diverse neighborhoods across the city. And that's what we've been working towards. That's what MIH was completely based upon was trying to make sure that we got mixed income buildings, mixed income neighborhoods. Um, that is what all of our efforts on 421A were directed towards. So I think that vision has been articulated and we've been working towards it. Have we solved every problem? No. Have we, you know, thank God I'm not in charge of education, so I'm not gonna, uh, you know, take the bait on that. But I think we've been working very hard towards that, that vision. I couldn't agree more that there is a tension, and it's interesting that throughout the day, this tension has really been basically uh, swept under the rug. There is a tension between anti-displacement and fair housing, because anti-displacement, if it keeps mm -hmm. the community exactly the way it is, that is not economic integration. That is, in many cases, not racial and ethnic integration. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have to deal with those conflicts. We have to deal with the fact that sometimes those things are in conflict and we have to tackle that, right? Sweeping it under the rug, I don't think is gonna do the job. I think we have to talk about it honestly. And um, many, of, of course, the, one of the areas that this comes to fore is on the question of neighborhood preference that, um, that Olson talked about earlier and that many of us have been talking about. That's an attempt to prevent displacement and keep people in their, in their uh, current communities, but give them different housing opportunities as the rest of the housing, as the market rate housing uh, increases in value. So, but that's an area where some people claim that violates the Fair Housing Act. So that's a very direct tension, and we need to be addressing that tension. Um, so, uh, but to, to talk about some of the things that you asked about, now that I've um, thrown that provocative um, set of comments in, um, you know, a flip tax. Well, we have a mortgage recording tax. We have a variety of taxes. Of course, the city is not able to raise its taxes without the state's permission. And when we went to the state and asked for an uh, an, uh, a tax that could go into an affordable housing trust fund, of course, um, the state was not cooperative. We are delighted to revisit that issue and, and, and would, would be happy to talk about that. Um, anti-harassment, I mean, we are, uh, the city is doing a wide variety of things for anti-harassment. Some of them you've heard about. We're working very closely with um, both agencies within the city, health department, DOB, fire department, HPD, are out there trying to essentially do an early warning system, trying to look at buildings early on when we find out that they've traded hands into the hands of somebody who has in the past had problems, we're out there. When we you know, he are starting to hear from tenants that a certain pattern is developing, we're out there. That inter-intra-city agency group has inspected over 700 different buildings, has really looked at what's happening in 700 different buildings. And then we work with the state's TPU and the state attorney general and the district attorneys around the city to bring some of those to prosecutions, and, and you've heard about that. So that's a major anti-harassment effort. 
uh, Brad mentioned the legal services. We uh, This year we're devoting $100 million to legal services um, uh, for people who are being evicted or, or fear that they are being harassed. That is a game changer, I totally agree. Um, so, uh, so we are doing a great many things there. But I, I wanna come back really to something the Pernima said. The cause for displacement is when the housing supply doesn't keep up with the housing demand. And so the root cause of what we're talking about, of the harassment that we're talking about, is when rents increase so quickly because we're not building enough housing. So the main thing that we can do to prevent displacement is make sure that we're building that housing and especially that affordable housing in all neighborhoods across the city to take that pressure off. And we're trying our hardest on that. Um, MIH obviously was directed at that. Our efforts on 421A were directed at that. Our <laughs> efforts on uh, zoning for quality and affordability were meant to make it possible to build in many more circumstances at, at, you know, without all of the expense of unnecessary regulations. All of those things are meant to try to help us get the kind of housing supply that we need so that there isn't this incredible pressure on rents that then cause people to, uh, to harass or incentivize, not cause, but provide an incentive um, for people to harass and try to displace people. So, um, Can you speak specifically on accessory units and on planning for a downturn from the city planning perspective? So, um, you know, accessory units have been discussed for decades at this point. As, you know, we all know there is this sort of supply of largely affordable, largely unregulated, often unsafe housing that, you know, we should clearly look at. I think at this point there is a task force that is starting to look at some of these issues. I mean, some of the concerns on the regulatory regulatory uh, level are that these are regulated not just by city policy, but there are state, you know, multiple dwelling law uh, concerns. There are fire codes and other things that have to sort of work to make that housing legal. Um, but it's also often that while everyone wants this housing to be legalized, in many areas, you know, the neighbors once you start really talking about legalizing it and looking at the implications of, you know, a one or two family home set up becoming three or four family home and where are the, you know, services going to go, where are the parking cars going to go, particularly in the lower income communities, that becomes a real concern as well. I think doesn't mean we should not look at it, but I think there are a lot of complexities in in looking at sort of legalizing this. And, you know, some of the housing units may be getting legal light in the air. And, you know, to um, Dr. Bassett's point, I would say that the zoning does say health and welfare of the community as, as one of its missions. And, and I think this is where it does sort of come into play. So we are, you know, it's, it's something that needs a lot more work to get us to that point. And then uh, planning for a downturn. Uh, <laughs> so I want Karim and Wendy sort of to form a team and go all around our neighborhoods at this point, <laughs> and I think we can start planning for the downturn. But I think that, uh, you know, I think some of the policies that we are putting into place at this point, particularly MIH and the way, you know, if we continue to map areas with that mandatory inclusionary housing policy, I think that in effect, we are starting to plan for how to bring affordability and the market then can play the role that, that it can in its ups and in its downs. I mean, I would say in a neighborhood like East New York, for instance, um, the, you know, before we did the neighborhood plan, most parts of that neighborhood did not allow for apartment building construction. So if you want to see investment in affordable housing in a community like that, you have to have the framework that allows for that affordability to come in. So by, you know, going through this rezoning and neighborhood planning process, we have sort of been very careful about where we have upzoned those areas and where we are working very hard to preserve the existing housing. And I think 
one, it will start to have some impact on the speculation. Hopefully, you know, that leads to land prices at some point getting more even. But in a downturn, that is really where the affordable housing developers have the opportunity to sort of this, this is a long-term plan. This will, you know, play out in the next two decades longer. So it, we think that there is a lot of opportunity to bring in a lot of affordable housing, but bring in housing that is also starting to bring in people, not just at the 30% AMI, which we are working to do. You know, HPD created the ELLA program that does reach as low as um, sort of uh, financing would allow some of these housing uh, projects to go, but also housing for people that are at 50, 60, 70, 80% of the AMI, which starts to integrate neighborhoods, you know, in a way that are, that's a little more balanced and is not causing rampant displacement. Reaction to the, uh, the prior panel, any legislation maybe to come from the, the council? Um, let me take up uh, Vicky's gauntlet first. Um, uh, mostly to say I, I didn't think of that primarily as a criticism of the de Blasio administration. I mean, I think our housing policy framework in the city and in this country has not been about, doesn't have metrics for um, uh, inclusive, integrated communities. That's just not mostly what we've been trying to do. Uh, there's no doubt that MIH uh, and some of the anti-displacement tools uh, will help us get those kind of neighborhoods, um, but I don't think we have a, a clear framework on what we mean by that, and uh, who gets to pick whether your neighborhood is the one that's gonna have the 130% or the 80% units. Um, so, I, you know, I just, I think that's an area where I hope the dialogue you rightly say we need to have about thinking about fair housing and thinking about displacement. I'd like to see HUD let us approach that differently. Um, but I do think we need to be held to some standards. Um, I think it was more accident of history maybe than politics that the first MIH neighborhoods are low income ones. Um, but thinking about the totality of the city and where we're mapping it and how we're thinking about it and how many of those units we think should be in high income neighborhoods. Anyway, it'd be a good conversation for us to have, and I think we've got a great opportunity to do it. Um, just that wasn't primarily meant as a critique of the, of the housing plan. And I wanna hold that thought for my next, my next question jumps right off of Brad's point, but I, I do wanna hear from uh, you, Dr. Bassett. Give it a go. Okay, <laughs> uh, but particularly on, since we talked about accessory uh, dwellings and uh, health. Sure, uh, well, one thing that I, I wanna note is that sometimes when we talk about um, improving the status of poor neighborhoods uh, where many indicators, not just health indicators, by which I mean diseases, uh, but other indicators, educational attainment, uh, incarceration rates are, uh, indicate distress. We fail to recognize that a whole set of policies created uh, these, uh, these situations. These weren't uh, policy neutral developments, they were uh, they were sets of bad policies that drove the neglect of neighborhoods. Uh, but nonetheless, these are neighborhoods where we where, uh, are not just a, a collection of troubled individuals. They're neighborhoods that are laced together with institutions, sets of relationships, and neighborhoods that have assets that lend a resilience that goes beyond individual resilience. So we should just be very careful uh, about not considering that neighborhoods have resilience independent of their individual uh, people who make them up. Now, uh, I, I'm not sure what we're talking about. Are we talking about quarter housing and that, this sort of thing? We're talking about <laughs> this. units in basements, and basements, units in attics, because, but they are not know, legal. Basically, I, I don't think that in the name of expanding housing stock that it would be appropriate to um, to agree that unsafe, unsanitary housing is now acceptable. Uh, I would, uh, would uh, reference the origins of health departments in, uh, in uh, advocating against this and be supportive of my colleague who said, I think you said this takes more discussion. I'll just say that unsafe and unsanitary housing is unacceptable. 
let me quickly respond to that, because obviously I think no one means that anything, you know, there's a set of things which we would, none of us would want to see people uh, living in. There are, there's an estimate, there was a study now, it's about, I don't know, 10 or 15 years old, that there are probably 100,000 occupied units, and that was a while ago, so I wouldn't be surprised if it's more like, you know, who knows what that number is now, that are essentially basement units, many of which have some amount of light and air, um, and in some cases it's an issue of whether they have one or two means of egress. So there is a whole set of health issues and fire safety issues, but the, the analysis that was done suggests quite a lot of them are safe and healthy, and quite a lot of them could be made safe uh, and healthy with some modest uh, investment. And of course, you've already got, you know, three, four, or 500,000 people living in them. So pretending that they don't exist in the name of our codes is not nearly as good as trying to think about how to regularize them and make sure that, you know, the ones that are, you know, we can make safe and healthy, we do. And if, they, if we really don't think they are, then, are, you know, then we have to find something to, to do with, you know, to f recognize that there are people who are living there. So what a lot of us have been pushing for a long time is a pilot program. I don't think a blanket program around the whole city would work. Um, the politics are very complicated and, and you know, so uh, unfortunately I think they are largely um, uh, nativist, they're largely anti-immigrant sentiments more than they are fear of losing my parking space sentiments, but they are, um, they make for complicated, toxic politics. That said, the good news that I think Michelle alluded to is that in East New York, as part of the East New York rezoning, there was an agreement to set aside some money and set up a task force and try in a neighborhood that has more or less said, uh, we'd like to regularize a set of those units and see what that looks like, figure out how we make them uh, healthy and safe and, and bring them online then as regular units. And, and I'm, as hard as that's gonna be, optimistic we'll be able to make some progress there. Well, that sounds very logical. <laughs> um, but I just wanna point out that one of the really serious uh, complexities of that is if we were through this pilot to legalize some of those basement units that provided sufficient light and air and were safe and healthy, they will become most likely higher rent exactly. units. And then we face the question of, okay, so how do we protect the people who are there now against displacement? And that's really the complexity. Okay, and speaking of East New York, this is where I wanna pick up from where uh, Council Member Lander left off previously, which is to say, you know, mandatory inclusionary housing being this crucial tool in the toolbox right now um, for addressing uh, displacement. Um, I think in part because initial neighborhoods rezoned are lower income, um, I think it has really helped fuel a public perception that mandatory inclusionary housing is in itself a displacing force, that the units created are su not sufficient in number nor sufficiently deep in affordability to mitigate whatever displacement, the new development, the, the um, change density uh, would facilitate. Um, and so I just wanted to, and I think we heard that in part, I mean, we heard a lot from Michelle Neugebauer on the previous panel uh, about that sentiment. So I wanted to hear reactions to what Michelle said in that thought more broadly. So, um, you know, several points. I mean, for one thing, mandatory inclusionary housing is one of several tools in Vicky's vast toolbox that she's using to create affordable housing. I think what mandatory inclusionary housing starts to do in neighborhoods rich and poor is to say any time we create capacity for additional housing that we will ensure that a percentage of that housing remains affordable and remains affordable permanently. So it's affordable as long as the development stays there. Now, we can argue about whether, you know, the 40% to 80% that most of these programs sort of go through, or 60 to 80 with some going to 40 and some going higher, is the right set of AMIs or not, whether it addresses the needs, you know, in every neighborhood or not. However, what it does do is that in, in neighborhoods like East New York, where the city today does not own land on its own, which we did in the 70s and 80s, and we could go in and say, you know, we'll build what we 
think is, is appropriate here. We are trying to get market forces to come help build that housing. We are in some ways creating that opportunity to get the affordable housing in these areas that wasn't there before. In you know the 1.25 FAR, three, four family context, you, you know, you could not, the city could not invest the money that it is investing. The mayor has set aside $7 billion just on housing subsidies. So what it does allow us to do is to see what the market can harness, and then we can add to that in areas where that is necessary. So in East New York, the first 1,200 units of housing that the city has committed to building would go lower than the MIH limits are asking for. It would go as low as 40% of the AMI and up to 60% of the AMI. That's the one thing that it starts to do. The second thing is that that doesn't stop. I mean, Vicky will still go. She's working with Phipps Housing on one of those projects on not the city-owned property to try to get the lower income housing there as well. Um, in the hot market areas, and a lot of our private applications are in those areas, have historically been in those areas, our hope is that the public process will lead to projects where that mix of housing is you know, is enabled in, in neighborhoods like Chelsea, where we have um, a project currently in the process that is, you know, that is um, uh, uh, over a thousand units of housing with something like 300 units of affordable housing are possible. We have projects in downtown Brooklyn that are going through the process right now. We have projects in other hot market areas. But, you know, as you know, um, housing, development in this city is a democratic process that goes through the city's uniform land use process. It is, um, you know, ultimately there are many actors that have a say in what the AMIs are in where that housing project ends up. And I think we really need the housing community generally to sort of be supportive of these processes, particularly in areas that are wealthier where there is more resistance, whether it's nimbyism, whether it's fear of, you know, uh, whatever it is, that these projects don't fail, which a couple of them, you know, one has, and there are others that are on the brink of, of doing so. I think we are, you know, no one is saying that the housing program we have is perfect. I think the housing, the MIH program we have is the most aggressive housing program anywhere in this country today. And I think we all have to remember that we cannot let perfect be the enemy of very, very good sometimes. Can I just, I, I want to dispel this notion. The reason why East New York was the first neighborhood chosen for rezoning in MIH was that East New York had been for several years in a community planning process. So that made sense, given that we need to engage communities, given that, that planning is supposed to be um, you know, a framework within which we work with the community to try to figure out, as, as Michelle said, what does the community want, what do the institutions want, what, does the business, what do the businesses want, what does the community need? It made sense when we were coming in as a new administration to work in a neighborhood that had already spent several years identifying that question. It is not true that we are only imposing MIH on uh, low-income communities. We are working in several moderate-income communities right now, and we are relying on the private applications because there just isn't a lot of land in many places in Manhattan, in Chelsea, and the other high-opportunity, high-cost uh, places that we talked about other than through private applications. So that's the strategy. It's, you know, it's designed to deal with both where the planning is, where the land is, where the areas are way below their maximum uh, population. East New York had lost tens of thousands of people and is not nearly as populated as it was in the 1960s and, and below, so there was room there. So those are the kinds of considerations that are going into where we're looking at and where we're applying MIH. But I think the critical thing about MIH is that any time we permit substantial new capacity, we are insisting that the housing be balanced, that it include affordable housing for a range of incomes along with market rate housing. Um, and I, can I add one more thing? Of 
very short on time. So I, and I'm going to give Councilman Lander and Dr. Bassett, uh, Commissioner Bassett, a choice. You can either pile onto this conversation about MIH, or I know you wanted to speak about health equity, and I think you wanted to speak about bridging Gowanus. So take your pick. Um, we have <laughs> five minutes left. I do think it's important to be clear that the, the resistance is to density and development, not to MIH. Uh, and that is, it takes different forms in different neighborhoods to be sure, but whether people are fearing displacement or whether they don't want new tall buildings or whether they fear the loss of their parking spaces or whether they don't like the change they're seeing in their neighborhoods, it is, change is hard, and it is difficult to plan for um, growth in a way that people feel included, believe will improve their neighborhoods, um, and are willing to get on board with and be a part of. Like, that is hard. Um, and it's harder in a democracy, but presumably we prefer living in a democracy, even if it makes our development and land use planning more challenging. Um, I do think we are, we're trying to find some ways to do that. And I'm proud of some work that's underway in the council, you know, the speaker in East Harlem with East Harlem plan, um, uh, our work in Bridging Gowanus with Fifth Avenue Committee and lots of other partners, um, the work Councilmember Reynoso is doing in Bushwick, the partnership between the administration and Councilmember Richards in Far Rockaway. The more we can engage in community planning that tries to start early, that tries to invest a lot of stakeholders, um, it's not perfect. Uh, it's got a lot better chance of building a plan that people will feel included in and are willing to support uh, more density as part of a smart plan that includes a lot of affordable units, that includes the resources to address displacement, that addresses whether your schools are crowded, whether you've got enough parks, uh, whether you've got infrastructure that's focused on resiliency and sustainability, all of those things. So. Um, I do think that's our challenge in the, in the days ahead, um, and I think it'll be fair. Like, so far what we get is an incomplete, um, and by the end of you know, a couple of years from now, come back and give us a grade. Well, I just want to just reiterate what I started with, that, uh, that access to housing is a key element of health, and so that insofar as we succeed, in making affordable housing more available to New Yorkers, we'll have a healthier city. Part of what we've done at the health department to try and advance this, time was up before I even started talking, <laughs> so I'm just gonna, I have the mic, so. <laughs> the, um, is uh, set up um, something called the Center for Health Equity, and we have offices uh, left over actually in buildings from the days when LaGuardia was mayor and he was very pioneering in many ways uh, and built district health offices all over the city. And we've reimagined them in East Harlem and Central Harlem and parts of the Bronx and Central Brooklyn and have been collaborating in the planning, inclusive planning process that you've heard is contended uh, and necessary in a democracy. I just want to take my last minute of overtime to let you all know that the health department issues these reports on the health of community districts. These are, this is the entity that corresponds to community boards, and we have 59 of them, one for every community district in the city, uh, that contains a variety of measures, both individual health measures and as, uh, measures of health that individuals can't have. Uh, like uh, what is the quality of the housing stock in your neighborhood, what is the absentee rate from elementary school, uh, measures that are, reflect the overall health of a community. So I urge you to use these to think of health as both an input and an outcome of affordable housing. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you to our wonderful panelists, uh, Commissioner Bean, uh, Executive Director Kapoor, Councilman Lander, and Commissioner Bassett.